Today we wrap up a series called Let Go. <clears throat> it builds on another series called Hold On. And just like I've said almost every Sunday, I know that sounds like a contradiction, but it's not. We can only hold on to so much. We can only do so much. And to choose the most important things, we have to let go of some other things that aren't as important. That's just the way life works. It's not right or wrong. It's just true. But what we're looking at this morning as we wrap this up was one more time. Are we holding on to the things Jesus wants us to hold on to? Are, are there some things that we hold on to that might actually not even be wrong? They might actually be really good things in and of themselves, but they aren't specifically, precisely the things Jesus wants you to hold on to or me to hold on to or Morris and Hill to hold on to. What are the metrics? How do we know how this works? I use that word metrics. That's actually, we almost called this series metrics and we didn't for a lot of reasons that doesn't have much of a ring to it doesn't capture your imagination but what we're talking about this entire time really is how do we measure if we're actually getting God's will done or not there what what are the things that we know um, how many have ever heard of the smart goals system there okay it's pretty popular I didn't make it up it's right there but uh, to make a good goal in anything so just throwing this out whatever you're trying to accomplish it's good to make your goals specific and measurable, achievable, as in realistic, it actually could happen if everything works out well and you work hard. They're relevant and they're timely. We could spend a lot of time on all of those. You might have had some sort of course at work or school or somewhere, but this is the idea. We want to make sure that we are setting and achieving goals, measuring them along the way that are the things that Jesus wants done the most. Here, here's something we're going to find out in Scripture. If you, I, I'm pretty sure you already know this. We're going to remember it this morning probably. But God loves honest and precise metrics. If you're a note taker, this is your word, first word of the day. Metrics. It's, it's that word that means to measure things. But God loves that. We see that throughout Scripture. Let, let's say that statement together and then I'll unpack it a little bit. God loves honest, precise metrics. In other words, obviously, he doesn't want us manipulating whatever numbers there may be, whatever measurements there may be, to tell a story that's not true. Obviously, he doesn't like that. But also, if you walk through just the entire scriptures, there's a lot of really cool visions where angels are measuring out certain things very precisely. And even those measurements mean things. They represent things. There are numbers throughout the scripture, seven and ten and several others, that all represent certain things. And this means this. And when you multiply this number by this number, it means it even more. God likes stuff like that, apparently. He uses it all the time. If you look at creation and how incredibly intricate everything is and how everything works with math and how the Fibonacci numbers go everywhere and all the directions. There, there's just so many places where you can see that God likes order. He likes things to go well. His plans like how to build the ark, how to build the tabernacle. I could go on and on. God likes that stuff. But much more than just trying to be creative or intricate or precise, what it really comes down to is God is the ultimate source of truth. He's the ultimate source of goodness. And what he wants is that the good stuff happens at the expense of obviously any kind of actual bad stuff, but even sometimes at the expense of okay stuff. And as we go through life, here's what we, we see. Our perceptions of what's good and what's important change. Anybody else? Has this happened to you as you grow, as you, from what you thought was the most important stuff as a kid, as a preteen, as a teenager, as a college student, younger adult, slightly older adult, once you have kids, if you have kids, not everybody does. But different things that happen to us in our lives, they shift how we see things. How many of you know exactly what I'm talking about? God's perspectives don't really switch. They don't really shift around. They're the same. What's good is good. What's not is not. And everything that's good, even when we get it wrong, whatever is really absolutely good and pure can always be traced somehow back to God. 
Even the things that we do that are sinful, it's never okay for, with God that we sin. But the pleasurable part of sin is actually based in something he created or something that he created to be used a certain way, and we're just messing it up. The actual goodness in the sin is not the sin. It's the remnants of the original design. Are you, are you following me on this? You can trace the goodness, the truth, back to God even when it gets distorted. In Proverbs says, indeed, if you call out for insight and you cry aloud for understanding, if you look for it as for silver and search for it as for hidden treasure, then you will understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. For the Lord gives wisdom. From his mouth come knowledge and understanding. At the end of the day, if we want anything to work, in life. We've got to go back to the original source. We've got to go back and say, well, what does God say about it? And especially if we are Christ followers, if we are a church, if we are a group of people who are trying to define our lives by that, this is who we are. We follow Jesus. And again, you see very specific and smart, uh, measurable, achievable, and relevant and timely goals all throughout the scripture. Here, here's one, Proverbs 11, 1. He's talking about those weights and measures that they used to use back then. He says, a false balance is an abomination to the Lord. A just weight is his delight. In other words, God actually just really likes it when everybody's using weights that weigh what they mean and being fair to one another. All the way in the New Testament, Jesus himself says, Judge not, you will not be judged. Condemn not, and you will not be condemned. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. Give, and it will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over. It will be put into your lap. <clears throat> Excuse me. For with the measure that you use, it will be measured back to you. Back in the Old Testament, Micah 6, verse 8, very common verse. But again, it shows just how clear God makes it. His core expectations don't really shift around that much. He says, he has shown you, O man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you but to do just, justice, to love mercy, to walk humbly with your God. The rest is kind of details. Day after day, the things that Jesus wants us to get done are going to somehow fall in those categories, even after everything that did change in the New Testament. In Galatians, Paul writes, Do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. Whoever sows to please their flesh, from that flesh will reap destruction. Whoever sows to please the Spirit, from the Spirit will reap eternal life. So let us not become weary in doing good. For at the proper time, we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. Therefore, as we have an opportunity, let us do good to all people, especially to those who belong to the family of believers. Those are pretty smart goals, aren't they? Literally smart goals and also that same kind of acronym kind of way that goals are most effective. I don't know about you, but I, I go through seasons in my life where I, I feel like I'm just getting everything done and other seasons where I feel like I'm not even sure what's happening at all. And I have to keep coming back and saying, okay, what is the most important? If nothing else got done today, what is the thing that God wants me to do today? And I found that in some ways, it's, it, it, there are certain things that never change. Let, let me just ask you guys really quick. Is it ever not God's will for us to be kind? That's an easy one. Yeah, no, it's always God's will to be kind. Even to the people that are really, really slow in front of us in line. Even to the people that are rude to us. To the, it's always God's will to be kind. Is it, is it always God's will to be generous? Is it always God's will to be honest? There are things that just never change. That's just always how it is. But sometimes in the moment, it's kind of hard. Yeah, but if God was here right this minute and he saw what they just did. You know what I mean? Have you ever felt that way? But his will does not change. That kind of stuff doesn't change. Those values don't change. What does change is there are days when 
he wants us to go to work and do such and such and such and such. So there are days when he wants us to stay home and take care of somebody who's sick. Are you with me? But we've got to be in touch with what's most important. Well, we've used a lot of Venn diagrams this time. Uh, there's a lot of contrast. Uh, another possible sermon title for this series, when we, were, we knew what God wanted to tell us, we were trying to figure out how to explain it, how to make it clear and memorable and, and all of those things, um, was this versus that. And that one got thrown away as well. But there's a lot of this. And one more time, we're going to walk through these. If you missed these, uh, you can take a picture. All those messages still live online. They're important because these are some key metrics that are throughout the scripture. These are some things that don't change. These are some things that we can always hang our hats on and know this is God's will. This other thing is not. Good metrics, for example, are always going to help us focus on Jesus and what matters most to him. Bad metrics, it's not that they're evil, it's not that they're the devil's idea, it's just they're going to keep us focused on things that maybe Jesus doesn't care that much about. There are a lot of things in life that are good, they're wholesome, they're okay, they can be traced back, the goodness in them can be traced back to Jesus, but Jesus really doesn't care that much about those things. There are other things that he says, this has to get done. Good metrics keep us focused on those. So let's walk through these one more time, just really quickly try to apply these one more time. And I hope this helps you as much as it helps me. I'm a very visual person, so we're, we're going to do that. First, let's look at 1 John 2, 6. Here's one more metric Jesus gives us. By this, we may know that we are in him. Whoever says that he abides in him ought to walk in the same way as he walked. In other words, all of it is going to look like Jesus. If we get all this stuff right, it's going to make us look more like Jesus. Let's look at these one more time. First off, we're going to walk through life from a position of trust instead of a, uh, a position of control. We explored in detail several weeks ago, we actually don't have control. We think we do. We spend a lot of time and waste a lot of stress and anxiety trying to gain control and hold on to control we think we have, but we really don't have it. But when we approach life and approach our priorities from a position of trust, amazing things happen. That's why as we plan to grow as Christians, as individuals, as small groups, as a church, we've got to remember to trust God enough to make his priorities our priorities. To take responsibility to get down to things that we know are always his will and put that first, even over things that we think are very important. We also looked at that contrast between belonging and approval. Belonging is what we really crave. Belonging is a sense of community that's based on some sort of a shared purpose, some sort of a shared identity. And we as humans always look for that no matter how many thousands of wrong places we look, we're always looking for that. The only one place to really, really find that is in God. And the worst way, the worst way to try to find it, the least effective way, the least S-M-A-R-T smart goal way to find that is to demand approval from everyone else. When we just say, hey, you've got to accept me as I am. Deal with me. Deal with me as I am. That, that really just never works. What does work is when we mutually put each other first, and even more when we mutually put each other and Jesus first, we all change and we end up finding that belonging. We find that approval. We find that commitment, that relationship that we're craving so badly. We looked at connection versus checklist. That we go through life, we go through whatever looks like religion to us. Uh, remembering that there's got to be a connection between us and God and connection between us and other people. If we're just checking things off of a list and then retreating into ourselves again, we miss the whole thing. As I was doing that several weeks ago and I kept saying that between us and God, between us and others, somebody came afterwards and they said, you know that looks a lot like that big cross behind you when you wave your arms like that. Yeah, it does, doesn't it? I didn't make that up. But it does. That, that Jesus puts little clues everywhere. 
Thanks for sharing that, the person who brought that up to me. We spent um, a lot of time talking about what it, the difference between being a follower and a passenger. A passenger is somebody who's just kind of along for the ride and they're missing it. They're wanting people to pamper them. They're wanting people to entertain them because they just can't believe they have to be on this journey at all, but okay, I'll be there. A follower is somebody who is actually in the driver's seat but following the people in front of them. They're actually taking responsibility to go where the leader goes. And Jesus did not call us to be passengers but to be followers, to actually engage, to actually consciously go where he goes, do what he does, to pay attention and to relentlessly pursue him, to use the blessings that he gives us to bless others. How how many have experienced that? Let me just pause for a moment in the middle of these Venn diagrams. How many have experienced that where you've used what God blessed you with to bless others and you've, you've found what we're describing here, that the trust pays off better than control, that you find real belonging instead of demanding approval. How many have experienced that? Almost all of us, praise God. And all it, it's there for all of us. This is real. This is true. This is just always true. Here's just a couple more of these, and then we're going to look at some Bible stories and apply this to our lives. But we talked about the contrast between worship and just putting on a program. I'd I, I let you peek behind the curtain of how we do things here and, and invited you where we're always trying to get better at it. But real worship is not about which songs you sing, how you do communion, how you do prayer, how you preach. Real worship is about are you really pledging allegiance to the King of King or not? Are you actually connecting with God or not? And when everything you're doing whether it's very formal or very informal, whether they're recent songs or really old songs or extremely old songs or no songs at all, instruments or no instruments or all the other things that have been controversial over the years, those things, they matter, but they matter because they help us to actually focus on what we need to focus on or not. They don't matter in and of themselves. What matters is that worship, when we say we're having worship, when we worship God by the way we live out every single day, is that we are pledging our allegiance to Jesus Christ as the King of kings and the Lord of lords. We're committing to that together and individually. We're fully engaging with him. Talked about the idea of growing instead of collecting. That we don't just randomly go through life just saying, hey, I like that idea, I like that idea. I like the way that business does that, how that church does that. We're going to make this kind of Frankenstein monster thing and, and it's going to be our own deal. This, we're going to like this. That rarely works at all. It never works well. What does work well is to do things more like how God designed things. You plant what you want to grow and you fertilize it and you take care of it and you water it and you nurture it and eventually it bears the fruit that it's supposed to bear. We, we, there's design. There's design. And last week we looked at the idea of favor, the biblical concept of favor versus popularity. We all want to be popular. We want people to like us. We want people to say nice things about us. We want people to to think nice things about us, even if they don't say them. We want our reputation to be strong. But it really doesn't matter as much as who, if our real identity is good or not. And favor is not so much popularity. Favor is more of an acknowledgement of there is a connection between God and us. And that, as Paul said, as much as it depends on you, there is a connection between you and other people. They can always shut it down. The people you love, the people who hate you, they can always shut it down. But as much as it depends on me, as much as it depends on you, we can live in such a way that there can be favor. We're not trying to get them to say nice things. We're trying to be like Jesus. So we've looked at all those and they all swirl around and they all sound great and they're all cool little contrasts, but today we get to the most important thing. And I've said it already several times, I said it along the line, but we're going to make it really, really clear. that The key to all of this is Jesus Christ himself. The X factor, 
The thing that makes all this possible is Jesus Christ himself. If there wasn't a cross, there wouldn't be this connection or this connection, either one, ever. It couldn't happen. We can't do that without Jesus. If there wasn't an empty tomb, we wouldn't have any hope. If Jesus wasn't going to come back, if there wasn't any of the things that he's promised us, there wouldn't be any hope. Jesus Christ is the X factor. Our connection to Jesus Christ himself, the person of Jesus Christ, is what makes all this other stuff possible. The more we get to know Jesus, the easier it is to trust him. And I'm not going to go through all those one more time, but that's how this works. It connects with Jesus. I think it's interesting that um, the, using that X, I just here's a little church history for you, okay? Just th- throwing out there. The first several centuries, they didn't use a cross as a symbol. The cross was still such an offensive thing in, uh, across the, just everywhere in the Roman Empire that nobody was going to wear a cross t-shirt or cross earrings or something. It just was creepy. It didn't really mean what it means to us yet. But what they did use was the Greek letters key and rho superimposed over each other. Key looks like an X and rho looks like a P. So it looks like XP, but they would say it key rho. And they were already used to making that little thing because if they were labeling something kind of shorthand that it was good, the, the Greek word krestos begins with key rho, and they put that X rho, XP key rho, they'd put that on it, and you'd see that little symbol and go, hey, this is the good stuff. And the Christians started ad- adapting that because the Greek word Christos, which we turn into Christ, it means the Savior, it means the Messiah, it means the only one who can actually save us, the one that all of our hope is in. That letter, that word starts with key rho. And so they do that little su- superimposed thing, and that would represent this belongs to the Christ. This belongs to Jesus. And then as time went on, then they expanded that to five Greek words. Yesu, Christu, Deu, Weu, Seu, Ter. And that means Jesus Christ, Son of God, Savior. You might have seen this before. That's the ichthus. There's that key again. There's the sigma at the end. But there's a, that, that, that little word. And, and again, this is just kind of a I guess a coincidence, maybe it was part of God's design, I don't know. But the Greek word ichthus means fish. That's why the fish got put around it sometimes and why eventually sometimes they just put the fish because, again, they were being persecuted. The early church was, went through so many seasons of persecution that they had to keep things si- simple. They, they weren't building buildings and putting a great big cross on the steeple, okay? They had to s- very simply write it in the dirt or put it on the, scratch it into the doorpost or something, a little key row symbol or a little fish or something. The whole point, though, and we spend a lot of time with one more Greek word. We're going to go back here, but this is so important. Euangelion is the Greek word that we, we get evangelism and evangelistic and a bunch of other evangel kind of sounding words. But what that means It doesn't necessarily mean any of the things that we tend to think it means, like conservative or Protestant or Catholic or whatever other you've been taught. Well, are you an evangelistic person? Are you evangelical? All those words, they mean so many different things today. All it meant back then was it meant the proclamation. The proclamation is the declaration that Jesus Christ is Lord. That you have, if you had experienced the euangelion, that's that's where we get the gospel idea, the good news, then that meant you finally got it, that Jesus Christ is Lord. The promised Messiah for the Jews, the one and only Savior for everybody else, including the Jews, the whole thing revolves around Jesus Christ. The X factor, the key factor, if you would, Greek word key, get it? The key, you know? Never mind. But it all comes down to Jesus. And, And when we remember that, all of our little petty opinions and all of our petty ideas and all of our really good ones, they kind of get, as the old song says, strangely dim as we start getting more passionate about, well, if Jesus is Lord, what did he say about this? 
If Jesus is Lord, what's his answer to this? Does Jesus have anything to say about this? What about this? What did Jesus say? And when we do that, that's when the real power happens. It all comes down to that. And here's some things that Jesus did. Remember when he healed that blind guy? If you don't, it, he actually healed a, several blind guys. The one I'm talking about is in John chapter 9. This guy had been blind since birth. And Jesus heals him, and suddenly he can see, and his whole life changes, and everything's great, and all the people around him are, are going, wow, that's so cool. This is the power of God. Look at this wonderful, tangible thing that has happened because of the power of God. And the Jewish leaders, the religious leaders, absolutely go ballistic. Why? Because they had the wrong metrics. They weren't measuring things the way God himself measured things. They didn't have a connection to the actual power. They are literally staring Jesus himself in the face physically. They're looking him right in the physical eyes, and they're missing the point. And if that's possible for religious people, people who had devoted their whole life to studying the Bible and to, to absolutely following every rule as best as they can understand it. If those people could look Jesus in the eye and not recognize him, I think it's really important that we keep coming back over and over going, am I really looking at Jesus and not just my ideas about him? It's got to come back to him so that he can keep opening our eyes. And Jesus said miraculous things, things we kind of quote and say, but think about what they mean. He said, the enemy comes to steal and kill and destroy. I come so that you might have life, life to the full. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And it's the same Jesus who asserts authority and says, therefore, this. Jesus said, by this will all men know that you are my followers, that you have loved one another that you love one another as I have loved you. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go into all the world and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey all the things that I have commanded you. And I will be with you always to the very end of the age. <laughs> it's Jesus. The whole thing is not just ideas about Jesus or our interpretations about Jesus or our, our, our traditions and our routines that kind of point back to Jesus. It's Jesus himself. And ultimately, that's the metric that we've got to keep coming back to over and over. Another person in scripture that I just respect so much is John the Baptist. Jesus himself said there's never been anybody born that was greater than John the Baptist. That's a pretty high compliment. <clears throat> Excuse me, especially coming from Jesus himself. But in Luke 7, John the Baptist had some pretty serious doubts himself. He's wondering, is Jesus really the Christ? He's the one who was there. His whole job was to tell everybody Jesus was. But he's wondering. Do you notice Jesus' answer to him? Most of you have heard this story. You can go back and read it. It's in John 7. John, everybody say John 7. You should always, always, never take my word for it. Go back and read this stuff in your, yourself in the Bible. It's not on the screen. Even if it is, go back. But I'm just saying, John 7. Jesus quotes the Old Testament and sends this message. He quotes some stuff that was predicted that the Messiah would do. But he says, go tell John it's happening right now. The blind are seen. The lame are walking. There's even dead people that are getting raised. And he lists all these things. He goes, John wants to know, am I really the one telling him these tangible things that we knew the Messiah were, was going to do? I'm actually tangibly doing those things. Just tell John and that'll help him out. Brothers and sisters, Jesus still wants us to get tangible things done. And the same power that flowed through Jesus himself flows through us. 
the Holy Spirit of God that, that, that Jesus said he was going to send after he ascended has come and is still here with us. And he still has the same power that he had in the very first century and while the Bible was still being written. And he still wants the same things. The core values haven't shifted. Some of the details, the specific ones still have. And the only way we know what those are is to stay connected to Oh, oh, my goodness. Let's try this one more time. <laughs> the core values never change. The only way we know the absolute details for today, for you or me today, Morrison Hill today, is our connection to? Jesus. There we go. Yes. Whew. I thought I just wasted half an hour. <laughs> let's wrap this up and let's make this just as practical as we can. And if any of the specific illustrations I give you here at the end aren't what you need to hear. My prayer is that the Holy Spirit tells you something different. I hope you write down something. I hope that one more time that you're remembering something that you need to hold on to. Maybe for the first time, maybe for the umpteenth time, but hold it on, hold on to it tighter than ever because that's what God is asking for. And whatever he's asking you to let go, even if it's something that's good, but it's not as good as this other thing. I hope you have the courage to listen. Number one, Jesus loves honest and precise metrics. Here's some, here's some really dumb metrics that we have sometimes. Well, at least I don't do this. Ever heard that one? Maybe said that one? Okay, yeah, that's not okay. That's not okay. Um, anything that's shallow, anything that's surface. Notice that Jesus did not tell us in the Great Commission to teach one another to debate He said, teach them to obey all the things that I've commanded. And I think it's so important that we go back and, and, and we, we actually remember that Jesus wants us to actually do things. One of my favorite things in the community, and it's happening more and more these days, and I'm so excited and proud of you guys collectively, is I keep hearing, if I, if I share like, hey, uh, do you know Jesus or whatever, with just a, a random stranger and invite them to church they go, oh, I hear this more and more. Oh, Morrison Hill. The person who, da-da-da, says they go to Morrison Hill. And they're really good things. The person who gave me some food the other day said they go to Morrison Hill. The person who works at Life Choices and helped my little sister, they work at Morrison Hill. The person who helped my grandma get a computer, they work at Morrison Hill. Like, there, there's some tangible things being done in, in the community and people go, oh, maybe I'll try this Jesus thing. Because tangible stuff matters. Tangible stuff matters. Not the name Morrison Hill, but the idea that the followers of Jesus actually do tangible things. That's one of the metrics we need to remember. Another one is that it all comes back to Jesus. The X factor is Jesus Christ himself. And sometimes that's very personal. By the way, I want to just thank you and ask you to keep praying not only for my wife, but for so many in our congregation right now that have really been struggling with health problems and grieving people they've lost. There's so much pain and so much goodness as well, but there's some pain going on. I want to thank you personally for everybody who's supported my wife and me in this. But I've been learning a lot about all of this. I didn't plan it. I didn't want that to be an illustration in so many of these things. But I've learned so much that at, at, on any given day, the last several days, the thing Jesus wanted most from me was just to take care of my wife. And I appreciate the, the grace and the love and the patience that all of y'all have shown us as some of the things that I know are important day after day just didn't get done because that was most important. Now that she's starting to get better, that'll shift again. But the values don't change, just the details, and it's all about our connection to... Jesus. Oh, man. <laughs> Let's try this one more time. It's all about our connection to... Jesus. Yeah! All right, now we're talking. But this idea of actual change, real change happens. I, I love whenever I hear somebody's got just one buddy who's holding them accountable or they're part of Celebrate Recovery or they're part of a small group here at the church or wherever that is actually like they're going through life together. 
Uh, th those are tangible things, day after day after day, where those relationships help us stay strong. I love that as we're going through as a church, we're making some big plans. Some of the things on the line right now is looking at the budget. We're looking at bylaws. We're looking at getting an executive minister. There's several things. But again, in all of those, my prayer, my encouragement to all of you, all of you who are involved in any of those, and every single one of you, if you'll pray for us as a church as we make these choices, help us to stay connected to Jesus. Help us to keep these metrics in mind. That we don't make any decisions about anything, money or bylaws or people or anything that aren't in tune with what Jesus Christ himself thinks are the most important things. I, I'd love for you to pray about that. And in your own life, I hope that you can make those choices that way. So here's where it gets really personal. The band's going to come back up. We're going to sing one more song. But here's where I need you to write, each one of you write something down if you would. Listen to the Holy Spirit. What is it specifically that God wants you to write down this morning to hold on to? What's something that you need to start or restart or just commit more than ever to because you're already doing it? But you know this is God's will for you. This is his priority for you. And what's something that you know you've got to let go of? What's something that you know that if it's a sin, it's obvious. It's got to go. You're not going to have that connection with Jesus or the people around you that you could have if that sin is right in the middle. It's just not going to work. And even if it's not sin, if there's something in your life that you've been convicted of this morning, that, that if you just didn't do that, even though it's not bad, you'd have so much more time and energy and passion and everything to do these other things Jesus is calling you to do. Are you willing to give that up? If you've never given your life to Jesus in the first place, if you need to recommit, if you need any kind of a personal decision that needs to be public, would you make it public? Just come down there. I'll be standing right there. We'll walk you through it. But would you all stand right now? Let's sing our passion to Jesus. Let's worship together.